All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started. Without further ado, my name is Daniel Snyder, and on behalf of Seeking Alpha, I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Energy's Next Big Move. So you've seen the recent headlines. Oil rockets north of $129 a barrel due to supply chain bottlenecks and geopolitical tensions, specifically the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And today, this morning, it drops below $100 a barrel before climbing back above $100 a barrel. We've all seen this story before. So gas is up nearly 55% from just a year ago. And the end of the year targets for gas prices are all over the place, with some people even saying it can go to $10 per a gallon. And that one's a mystery to me. Now, as the saying goes, in every crisis, there lies opportunity, and this is no exception. The question now is, will oil prices continue to ratchet higher? And with many stocks such as Occidental Petroleum, Marathon Oil, and Chevron flying out of the gate this year, have we already seen the best move in these energy stocks, or is there more upside potential to be made right now? And that's why we asked Michael Boyd, head analyst at Energy Investing Authority, to join us today. Michael is an expert in the energy sector, and he's going to break down the current state of play in the oil market, both in the states as well as abroad. And then he'll highlight a subset inside the energy group that he believes is offering a fantastic upside opportunity, as you see the man right there. And But many <laughs> investors are looking past it. He'll even give two names here today of two companies he believes has good risk reward right now within the group. Now, if you'd like to find out more about Michael and or Energy Investing Authority, he's offering a free two-week trial for a limited time. So give the service a test. Just click on the link that my team is going to post in the chat box and you can get started. If you have any questions during today's webinar, just type them in the chat box and we'll have Michael get to some of those after his presentation today as well. Now, before we get started, I just want to go ahead and do a quick poll with everyone that's joined us today. And it's specifically in regards to what I asked you earlier, gasoline prices. Where do you think the average price of gasoline in the United States will be by the end of 2022? We broke it up into three different answers there for you. We have lower than 25%, higher by at least 25 cents per gallon from where it is, which, uh, and within 25 cents per gallon from where it is now, plus or minus. Go ahead and jump on your screens there and give us your answer as to what you think, and we'll give it just a second, and then I'll share the results, and we'll get started with the man, the myth, the legend, Michael Boyd, who is looking at me, waiting to get started. I see him right now. Yeah, ready to go. I know you are. I know you are. Just give me one more second, watching all the participants answer this question. And we'll wrap it up here in just a few seconds. And actually, it's kind of split across the board. This is pretty interesting. Uh, all right. Higher by at least 25 cents per gallon from where it is now is holding just over 40% of answers. Lower by at least 25 cents per gallon from where it is now is 25%. And within 20, 25 cents per gallon from where it is now is 32%. Michael, we've got a pretty pretty split audience here today with us um, I mean, in regards I, to what they think the gas, gas prices are going to be doing here within the year. What do you think? I think it's uh, well, I think that's symptomatic of the market at large, right? That's where all this volatility is coming from. Everybody has their own different opinion and uh, kind of viewpoint of what's going to happen. And that always leads to uh, some ups and downs and gyrations in the market, especially on what seems like uh small news items so this is a uh, it's interesting i think uh people are on the right on the right track there uh at least for me i think by end of the year we're probably down uh on gas prices luckily so but i won't give it all away we'll see but. giving it all away we gotta pull it back <laughs> a second we gotta pull it back um michael why don't you go ahead and start just by telling our audience where's home base for you uh, i'm based out of raleigh north carolina i've been down here for 15 years or so now uh moved down here after college so you know obviously with uh uh, you know, March Madness going on. We got this Duke UNC game coming up. So I'm, I'm excited for that, but uh, should be a fun time around here. Yeah, Saturday, uh, Saturday, right? April 2nd. Yeah, Saturday we'll see that the Duke UNC, the final four coming in. First time then, in history. So, well, we'll see, isn't it? It's Coach K's last season for Duke as well, correct? That's right. Yeah, there's a lot, it's a lot of firsts in this tournament. So. There's a lot of competition. Well, let's go ahead and get into it. Why don't you go ahead and just tell our audience, how did you get started in investing? Yeah, I mean, uh, just like anybody else, my, my parents tried to instill some uh, some good habits in me when I was younger. Um, you know, I didn't necessarily think I would be in like the research or financial advisory background. I was heading into college, but uh, 
graduated uh, with a degree in economics and uh, started my uh, work life at, at a, uh, a registered investment advisor down here in Raleigh. This was 2008-2009, uh, so post uh, great financial crisis, but uh, stayed there for a few years, You know, did the usual stuff there, did some uh, private placements, client structuring of accounts, uh, moved to an investment bank uh, based in the area. I traded uh, residential mortgage-backed securities for four or five years. Remember, this was post-2009, so you can't blame, blame me for uh, uh, all the volatility that it led into that, but there was a lot of opportunity in that market. Uh, after the market crashed, I uh, did derivatives there for a while, uh, did internal audit as well. Um, and I had started writing uh, on Seeking Alpha maybe in 2014 or 15 in my spare time, just, you know, for me, putting my ideas down uh, into writing kind of helped lay out the thesis. And uh, I left uh, the investment banking world in 2016 and have been doing research trading and, uh, I guess, advisory work uh, in the every year since. So. Yeah, so you started in investing banking with mortgage-backed securities. We won't hold it against you. Yeah. And now you run the research service, uh, Energy Investing Authority. Now that's quite a journey. And I know the name kind of gives it away, but can you tell us what you focus on specifically? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, this is obviously, this is focused on the energy sector. And, you know, you know, the energy value chain is, is humongous. You have everything from producers to, to midstream pipelines to refineries. You know, I, I cover everything there. Um, you know, what kind of drew me into that space was, there's really not a lot of very strong public coverage available for investors to read, even for uh, kind of a, a low price to kind of get into that. You know, I think this is one sector in general where institutional investors have had a very strong advantage for a very long time, just based on information access. And uh, my goal has always been to help people. So I felt like I kind of kind of step into this world a little bit and, uh, and bridge the gap. You know, even though I didn't have any technical oil and gas out in the field expertise, you know, the financial background, I think I can kind of bring that to the plate. Um, and I think there's a lot of value to that, you know, the energy sector, um, definitely has, it has its ups and downs, you know, it's a, it's not, not, I'm not going to call it like a, a highly risky sector, but you know, the sector has had the most bankruptcies of any S and P sector, uh, basically every year since 2015 or 2014, if you go back in time, um, there's been some issues of, uh, abuse, especially for investors that get involved in things like, you know, the high yield space. So if you look at like master limited partnerships and uh, general partner, limited partner, uh, I guess IER resets and, and uh, just general things that kind of, you know, dividend cuts and all that stuff. So the goal is to kind of help investors protect capital and if they're uh, retirees, especially focus on income, making sure they avoid things uh, that they should not be in uh, and kind of take out some of the volatility, but still get exposure to a space that has, you know, a lot of potential and a lot of upside, especially as, a lot of listeners know if you were involved in energy at the lows in 2020 or even in 2021, you've made, you made, you know, excellent returns off the bottom. It's been a, it's been a great place to be. And I think it's going to be a great place to be going forward as well. Yeah. You mentioned it. I mean, everybody seems to have done well and now we're in a different market entirely. It feels like, and I can't help but think about, you know, everything that I mentioned in the intro, but there's no better time than now to speak with somebody like you to get a handle of what's going on with an oil within this specific inflationary geopolitical and ESG environment. The sector has been dominating with headlines with new multi-decade highs and some very volatile swings over the last week, few weeks. So I'm hoping you can translate this for us. What's the state of play right now for oil, both here in the U.S. and internationally? I mean, I think, you know, everyone kind of is going to tie this back into Russia and Ukraine, especially with everything that's going on right now. It's easy to kind of make that uh, the big issue. And to an extent, it is for today. But I think you have to remember that even prior to the pandemic, you know, there's a lot of volatility in, in oil and gas and, you know, oil prices and natural gas prices were going up, you know, before all of this all started. So, you know, if you go back to early 2020, you know, before the, you know, COVID-19 was a thing you had, you know, OPEC and Russia, you know, they formed OPEC plus this was a this was a whole thing, uh, putting the pressure on United States shale producers, you know, that they, they were highly offended at the idea that they were losing their kind of position as like the dominant player uh, in these markets. Um, so, you know, as they as these kind of kind of went on, you know, COVID-19 took place, you know, demand shrank, you know, crude, crude oil prices fell dramatically. Um, so, you know, 
investors remember oil prices actually went negative on the front month for a, for a while there in Cushing in, in 2020. So, you know, U.S. production still hasn't recovered uh, from those levels. And if you go, if you look towards today, uh, let me get my slide deck going on over here. Um, you know, OPEC Plus has committed to, you know, boosting production, but a lot of the smaller countries involved there have not been able to meet those particular targets. Um, whether you look at smaller nations like Nigeria, Libya, Kazakhstan, Angola, all of these uh, countries for, you know, for various reasons, you know, I don't want to get down deep into each and every single one, but whether it be neglected maintenance on their wells, you know, just general geopolitical issues like corruption and, and low investment from, from the governments involved. Um, there's a lot of headaches there and production just really has not been able to recover. You know, there are some potential offsets in the market. Uh, if investors are paying attention to the news flow today. Chevron uh, announced some uh, early agreements with Venezuela to maybe be able to boost production there. You know, I have to get the United States government on board um, as a potential replacement for, for Russian sanctioned barrels, but that's a potential uh, balancing point. Um, you know, you have a potential Iran nuclear deal that could bring some more currently sanctioned barrels back onto the market. So uh, there's, there's a lot going on here, but I think the big key thing is that uh, inventories remain super low. So if you look at the, the chart I have there, you know, based on early 2021 outlook versus what's the case now, you know, inventories globally just remain super low and that's put a lot of pressure uh, on oil prices. And that's a, to a large extent why uh, we're dealing with uh, some of the best oil prices that we had in, in many, many years. And that's a big benefit for oil and gas producers in general. Michael, you, you had mentioned OPEC plus in your response right then. I'm just kind of curious. I think other people might be as well. I mean, we know that there's OPEC and the plus becoming Russia. Um, why doesn't OPEC plus just increase their supply to help with the inventory and bring oil prices back down? Yeah, I mean, you know, Saudi Arabia definitely has some slack supply um, that they could bring online. I think that there's a lot of questions out there, you know, how quickly they could, but I think the the big thing is whether or not they, they will. And I think that just goes back to geopolitical relationships again, right? So if you remember, Russia is obviously a key player on OPEC plus and, you know, with, with uh, all the sanctions in place, they need to have uh, oil prices high, especially when they're selling, you know, Ural barrels at, you know, 25 to $30 a barrel discounts to Brent. So if they're going to be funding, you know, their internal, uh, internal needs, especially being cut off from the Western world, they need all the money they can get. And at least for them, especially, uh, in the near term, they want prices as high as it, as it can be. And, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is still a little bit better uh, with the Biden administration. Um, you know, there's been some, uh, I think, definite tensions there, especially if you go back to the kind of whole Khashoggi assassination and, and everything that went along with that. Um, you know, and, and the end of the day, you know, OPEC plus met recently and they called the global oil market well balanced, uh, despite, you know, the continued shortfall. So there doesn't really seem to be any support there. Um, you know, I think the Biden administration has reached out uh, time and time again to uh, to OPEC plus trying to uh, get them to bump up production. And uh, there just doesn't really seem to be any willingness from their side to uh, uh, to help provide some relief there. Yeah. So let's let's go back to your your viewpoint. Right. So we're talking about that's on the other side of the world for most of us. But where do you see oil going in the short term, let's say the next three months or by the end of the year? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, uh, short term price targets are always hard, but, you know, uh, at least on the, uh, the projection side for me, uh, for those that kind of follow uh, oil prices in general, right, you, this is a uh, some market with, with uh, it's a futures market, right? What's quoted in the market day to day, uh, that's the front month price. So that, that's what, uh, if you were an investor wanting to, to buy a barrel of oil and have it delivered tomorrow, that's the price you would pay. But if you go out to, you know, December 2022, or, even December 2023, there's a lot less liquidity in that market, but that gives you an indication of where prices are going to be. And um, prices out in the future are much lower uh, than they are now. Um, if you go out to 2024, for instance, oil prices uh, are expected to be back down in the $80 per barrel range. Um, I think in general, I think you're going to see that kind of unfold. You know, in this case, you know, the future futures market can be wrong, but in general, it tends to be a pretty good indication. Uh, and in this case, I think it's spot on. I think you'll see oil prices start to come down uh, over uh, 2022 and into 2023. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that oil and oil producers are a bad buy necessarily, but I think you definitely will see some relief, at least on the headline numbers uh, that are quoted out there. 
Michael, I feel like what, what you just said might be a shock to some people. Um, you and the futures market are saying the price of oil is going to subside by the end of the year. I mean, I know even the Fed is expecting inflation to calm down to under 5% by the end of the year, but that isn't deflation, right? That's just slowing down right. the price of upward pressure on prices. So how, how are we going to get the price of oil down in this environment? And how does this affect the various stocks in the energy sector? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the big thing there is, you know, the United States, you know, we've had some issues in ramping supply, just, just like any other uh, business sector that are dealing with uh, all the knock on effects from, uh, you know, inflation and supply shortages and higher raw material costs, you know, if you you're an, an oil producer and you want to drill a new well, you're on like a six month lag time. But, you know, a lot of these producers started firming up their drilling plan, plans back in, uh, you know, Q4 of last year. Um, so you're starting to start to see that hit uh, in probably June or July. I think the Permian Basin, especially if you look at the 2022 exit rate versus 2021, you know, just from the Permian Basin alone, we're probably gonna be six, 700,000 barrels uh, per day higher. Um, and then in general, on the OPEC side, I think uh, you'll see some relief start to come through. Um, I think, you know, especially with the Chevron announcement, I think if, if everything goes well there, you'll start to see uh, some boosted production from Venezuela make its way into the United States to kind of offset Russian sanctioned barrels. I think you'll start to see some of the issues in the African uh, uh, nations that are part of OPEC. I think you'll start to see those uh, issues start to uh, ease. So I think we're going to get into a situation where there's going to be a uh, mild, uh, I'm talking maybe just uh, 100 or 200,000 barrels a day, but a mild supply uh, 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 outstripping demand um, as we get into the end of the year. And, you know, we are working off a very, very low uh, global oil and liquids inventory base. But, you know, in general, when you have some sort of uh, mild supply uh outstrip like that, you're going to start to see prices come down. So uh, I think that's a good thing for consumers uh, when it comes to, to the pump. Um, in general, you know, lower crude prices generally translates to uh, a lower refined product costs, whether it be gasoline, diesel, or jet fuel. Okay, so we covered the macro side of the industry. Let's go ahead and move more micro and specific for our audience, because here in my notes, um, I see there's a subsector within the energy group, which you feel isn't getting the attention it deserves. Which one is that? Yeah, I think, you know, especially as we look into uh, this year, I think natural gas stocks have been neglected for quite some time. You know, I have a, a slide here. This kind of shows the price performance of crude oil versus natural gas producers since 2020. Um, so obviously, as you can see there, um, it's been a pretty big gap uh, between how uh, natural gas producers, this is, you know, U.S. based producers like, you know, EQT Corporation or someone like that compared to, you know, a, a Buffett name like Occidental Petroleum have performed. So I think that, you know, there's a lot of value there. And if you look on a relative valuation basis, so if you take current strip prices, you, you hold that as your constant and kind of use that as your, uh, your cash flow model base. Natural gas producers look cheaper than oil on a go forward basis at the moment. Uh, that's really interesting. So where does this where does this take us? Yeah. So this is uh, this is like a slide here on why diversify into in, in natural gas, right? So uh, as we were kind of talking about, uh, there's a lot going on with crude oil when you think of it. This is this is crude is a decidedly uh, global market. Obviously, there's different grades of crude. You have Brent, you have you know West Texas Intermediate, you have you know the Canadian grades, but you know natural gas tends to be consumed more locally. Um, obviously, you have things like LNG, but, you know, pipelines can only be so long in many cases. So, uh, and, it's, and, and especially when you think about the United States, LNG is still a pretty small share of the overall demand market. And I think the big thing with natural gas, as you kind of look out, you know, we can all debate when peak oil is going to be. Everybody that was predicting peak oil and, you know, seems like forever, right? So, you know, there are pe people were saying peak oil in 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020. Uh, now it seems like the base case is 2030, but the big thing with natural gas is um, global demand is expected to be higher in 2050 than it is right now. And that's a fairly universal standard. And I think no matter where you fall on the when peak oil question, uh, when, when that is going to be that question, uh, nearly everyone is going to still come to the conclusion that natural gas has a longer tail. 
So uh, I think that's a, that's a big positive when it comes to thinking about this market. You know, as you get into topics like ESG as well, you know, that's maybe a, a dirty word among some retail investors, but it's you know, still a big thing that institutional investors care about. Uh, natural gas is the, uh, the cleaner uh, burning fuel. You know, this is still viewed as a bridge fuel among many people. And especially as you think about uh, places like Europe that maybe steps too far towards solar and wind as offsetting uh, their old uh, natural gas and crude oil plants, you're starting to see them kind of walk that back and get back to thinking about natural gas as a bridge fuel. So I think the demand outlook looks very, very strong. Um, I think in general, I, mean, I think it's just natural gas is the place to be in, in, a, in a lot of cases. Yeah, just last week, I actually saw Seeking Alpha's news team cover a store saying the U.S. Energy Department just approved specific companies to export additional liquefied natural gas amounts. The report also stated, with Europe facing an energy crunch caused in part by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the Energy Department also says every operating U.S. LNG export project is approved to export its full capacity to any country where not prohibited by U.S. law or policy. Now, you said... There's two stocks mm -hmm. that you believe are positioned currently to take advantage of this move higher in natural gas and have as much as 50% upside from here. And that's some great alpha. So I'm just wondering, I know our audience is wondering, what's the first one? All right. Well, I'm starting today with, with Comstock. Uh, this is, I have a $17 uh, uh, price target on Comstock. It's been a big mover over the, the past week or so. Um, you know, these are all companies that, um, you know, just to, let, uh, let everybody know I'm long, both of the companies I'm going to talk about. Um, I've covered these companies extensively on, on an energy investing authority over the past uh, several months, um, and I plan to own them for a long time. Um, but yeah, just to get into to Comstock specifically. So the, the big thing with Comstock is it's a, it's a player in the Haynesville Shale. So this is located in, uh, in Louisiana, and uh, some of it kind of stretches over the border into Texas. Um, as you kind of think about natural gas in the United States, uh, people tend to think about uh, the Marcellus shale up in, up in the Northeast. Um, unfortunately, a lot of production growth there is curtailed. Uh, a lot of pipelines are just not being able to be approved there. You have a, a very vocal uh, uh, group of people um, either with lawsuits or in the court systems, especially the Fourth Circuit Court, that it continued to uh, to knock down these pipelines. So that any any growth in in, uh, in natural gas out of that area is constrained. And then when you think about the Permian and Eagle Ford, uh, you think about associated gas. You know, LNG developers don't really want to count on uh, natural gas so sourced from basins that are that are oil directed drilling. Right, there might be lots of natural gas coming out of the Permian, but at the end of the day, uh, producers are there for oil. So if oil tanks, then you know drilling rigs fall and then all these LNG developers don't have a source of natural gas for, for feed gas. So um, Comstock uh, is a big player in the Haynesville. A lot of the acreage has been consolidated there. Um, you know, geology is very tough. So anybody that's been there for a long time has a real distinct advantage. Um, there's been rampant consolidation. So there are not a lot of options out there to buy. Um, 2021 was a rebuilding year for them. They did a lot of work on the balance sheet, uh, refinanced a lot of debt paid down a lot of debt. Um, they had a kind of unfortunate hedge book. So they kind of got caught with their pants down a little bit when it comes to the rise in natural gas prices, but that's, you know, eased this year. So I think, you know, as you get into this year, you got higher natural gas prices. They're going to make a bucket load of free cash flow. Um, I think you'll see an implementation of a shareholder return program this year, whether that be a variable dividend or stock buybacks. And, you know, there's been a lot of, like I said, there's been a lot of strength in the name lately, but I don't think that's going away anytime soon. All right, so we have Comstock obviously benefiting from higher prices, ticker CRK. And what's the other one? Yeah, the other one I have for, uh, for our listeners today is Vermilion Energy. This is ticker VET. Um, so what's, what's unique about uh, Vermilion is, you know, they're a, uh, they have a dual listing. So they have an American and Canadian ticker. Um, so people kind of tend to think of them for their Canadian operations. You know, they make, you know, produce a lot of light oil up there in Saskatchewan. Um, but what's unique about them is they have a, a pretty big presence in Europe as well, uh, especially in Ireland when it comes to producing natural gas. So uh, Europe has uh, their general natural gas fields have declined a lot over the past 10 years. Uh, domestic production is down 15 or 20 percent. They've been increasingly reliant on Russia and Nord Stream, to, Nord Stream and all these other 
uh, pipeline from Russia to supply their needs versus producing it at home. Um, obviously, that's has not worked out in their favor as you know recent ge geopolitical stuff kind of plays into that. But European gas prices are up tenfold um, uh, since pandemic lows, so that makes oil look like a cakewalk uh, in comparison. Um, politicians there are frantic for a replacement for uh, for Russian gas. Um, you know, Vermilion uh, made a great acquisition from uh, Equinor recently. Um, they already had an interest in Korg Field, which is this uh, Irish natural gas play. That's the only source of uh, domestic gas in Ireland. And politicians there remain very uh, against LNG imports. Um, but at the same time, it's very supportive of gas. They have plans for four more uh, natural gas power plants uh, to be built in short order. So. Uh, you know, they're going to be extremely reliant on Corrib going forward, and I think you might actually see them allow a little bit more uh, development there, including infield drilling, which historically they have not allowed. Um, so uh, for Vermilion specifically, um, they recently restored a monthly dividend. Uh, I think there's going to be some share repurchases this year, even with a recent acquisition that they announced yesterday, uh, which adds another wrinkle to the story. Um, I have more of that coverage on that deal uh, within EIA. And uh, you know, versus everybody else, dirt cheap uh, on relative valuation. Um, gobs are free cash flow. They got a lot of options with what they're going to do with that. Um, and just like everything else in energy, the, the story is all about relative valuation, especially compared to uh, other sectors, whether it be tech or industrials or anything like that. You know, the free cash flow here is, is, is humongous, and that's going to pay dividends for shareholders going forward. Yeah, it sounds like the stories are a little bit similar. It's free cash flow is king. Right. Yeah, so free cash flow is king. If you got the cash, then that, that's what matters. So exactly. So just for review for our audience, Comstock ticker CRK was the first pick and Vermilion Energy ticker VET. It all it also is worth noting out that as you were talking about VET, seeking office head of quantitative strategy Stephen Kress sent in a message and said VET is actually one of the top quant value energy stocks as well from the seeking alpha quant system. So it seems like Oh, look at that. You got a good pick. I'm, I'm a good that, company. Right there, right? Exactly. Amazing. Exactly. All right. So let's, uh, now that we've gotten a good overview here, uh, where can everyone watching this webinar get <laughs> a deeper dive into your research and stay up to date on if you move your price targets up on these two stocks? Right. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, you know, Energy Investing Authority is hosted here on, you know, the Seeking Alpha Marketplace. You know, I think you guys will be happy to kind of dr drop a link to the free trial down in the chat box, but, you know, two week free trial, you know, it, feel free to kind of stop by, poke around, look at everything I have to offer. You know, I cover VET and CRK, you know, as well as, you know, dozens of other stocks uh, in pretty high detail. Um, you know, kind of great value proposition there, you know, relative valuation spreadsheets, all the good stuff that investors really need to make informed, sound investing decisions in this space. Uh, and I like to think I won't steer you wrong, but hopefully I give you a chance to kind of uh, check out my stuff and uh, go from there. Yeah, that's all we ask. Now, I'm going to go ahead and ask if our Seeking Alpha team can drop the link to the sign up for the trial into the chat box at this time. And Michael, as you mentioned, is currently offering a two free week trial. So you can see everything Energy Investing Authority has to offer just by following that link and signing up. Um, Michael, great, great discussion today. Um, and I hope you're ready because the list of questions that are coming in from the audience. <laughs> I'm sure they're, is, they're endless. Uh, is I'll have just, a sip of coffee and I'll be good to go. It's amazing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with this first one here that came in, um, pulled by our team, says, many people I know in the industry say that the current administration tone and regulation is impacting rig count and supply. What are your thoughts? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, part of the, my approach to, to this to this, uh, to the sector, you know, talking with senior executives. And I think, you know, the big thing that I hear from them, you know, whether if I talk to Occidental or, you know, Apache or any of these big names is the, the big thing that they kind of felt like they were being left out of this discussion, you know, you know, especially early on with the Biden administration kind of reaching out to OPEC plus trying to figure out, you know, high gas prices, how do we kind of like pull this down, you know, obviously, that's a it's a big issue for the Biden administration whenever it comes to you know re-elections and things like that. Because consumers they don't want to have to be you know paying these prices, right? It's you know it's it's bad for for re-election. Um, and uh, frankly, it seemed like the you know the U.S. industry was kind of left out of these discussions. Nobody kind of reached out to talk to them, and you know I think they felt a little bit disenfranchised. And if you look at some 
potential pitch bills, you know, you've seen like windfall profit excise tax kind of like pitches or uh, large taxes on, uh, you know, some of the larger producers, whether it be Exxon or Chevron or any of these large names, you know, uh, I think the industry in general feels like raising production, you know, granted, yes, prices are higher, but they feel like they're being, they would be being punished, I guess, for uh, helping solve a problem for the Biden administration rather than being helped. And um, on the other side of the equation, you know, these companies, they were, at the end of the day, it's driven by what shareholders want. And shareholders have, you know, spoken very loudly that they want shareholder returns, they want dividends, they want stock buybacks, they don't want capital pushed towards, you know, further investment, they, they want to make sure that, that there's something left for them at the end of the day, because the industry does have a somewhat bad reputation if you go back to 2014 to 2017 or 18 for uh, largesse and uh, not investing for the future. So they want to make sure that, uh, that their investment is being protected. So there's a, you know, at the end of the day, a corporation is run for its shareholders. So. Yeah. I think we all realize that too, with Warren Buffett's recent buy, right? Occidental exactly. Petroleum. I mean, he's stepping up and of course he wants the value brought back to him as an investor. Um, exactly. This, this question is uh, continuously asked from multiple people throughout the webinar. What do you think of MLPs? Um, I like MLPs personally. Um, obviously, if you're an international investor or someone where there's, you know, tax issues, or if you uh, just have had some bad experiences with K-1 forms in general, then maybe you want to avoid the MLP space. Um, I think you have to pick your spots. Um, I think one thing that investors have neglected in the past when it comes to MLPs is thinking about corporate governance. If you think about uh, kind of like management incentives and alignments, um, I think uh, the sector was kind of dogged by investors kind of running into some of these names with, you know, especially if you go back a few years, 10 to 15, 20% like dividend yields, and then uh, they got the, the rug pulled out from under them. So I think you have to really think about um, who you're investing money along with and what their incentive structure is, because you know, at the end of the day, especially with these captive partnerships, what is good for management and the general partner isn't necessarily what's good for you as an investor. So you have to be careful about that. But at the end of the day, I think there are some good spots in the sector, but you have to pay a lot of attention to the corporate governance structure. Yeah, solid points. We had a question from Robert that asked, do you see any increased supply coming from your northern neighbor, Canada? I think so. I think uh, if you go through the pandemic, I think the big thing with Canadian producers is it's lower decline rates than, than U.S. shale. Um, so production did not fall as much during the 2020 period, and they've been quicker to ramp up supply um, in, the, uh, in the time since. Uh, the big question with uh, Canada is how they get this to market, right? So you had Keystone XL killed, um, you had Line 3 replacement project come through, and um, trans, uh, the Trans Mountain expansion, uh, you know, the government has decided they're not going to spend any more public funds to, to build it, so they're going to have to bring in outside investors. And that project has had its own delays since uh, it was uh, sold to the gov government by Kinder Morgan. So the question with Canada, I think they're more than willing to ramp supply, it's just whether or not they can get it across the border to us in the first place. Yeah. So Jeff asks, there are some really supply constraints in drilling materials and steel, et cetera, as well as the labor. Also, the fracking trucks aren't all up to the latest new environmental standards. All of this is leading to less new rigs and drilling in place. Do you have any comments? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, there's spot on there, right? That's a big question. Uh, as we get into 2022 and uh, all the EMPs kind of setting their drilling uh, programs for this year, um, the question has continuously been like how much more expensive it is to drill a, a, a well this year, um, getting the labor in place. And if you look at 2020 and 2021, a lot of these companies um, weren't necessarily drilling as much. They were working down their drilled but uncompleted inventory, right? So the, you know, those are called ducks in the, in, in the industry. Those are wells that, you know, they drilled it and now they just had to complete it, right? Um, so a lot of those inventories are down. Um, I think in my talks with the industry, some of these issues are starting to ease slightly. Um, I think they tend to be a little bit more optimistic as they kind of get later into the year. But, you know, unfortunately, especially on the labor side, right, a lot of these guys have been through so many uh, boom and bust cycles, right? So, if, you know, if you were an, in an industry worker in 2014, you were riding high, then you got laid off in 2016, then you get rehired in 2017, then you get laid off again in 2020. You know, it, get, it gets a little bit old uh, after time, especially uh, uh, 
uh, even with even with the money involved and you know with the labor market so tight right now a lot of these guys have uh, have other options um, so the the industry is kind of working hard to uh, figure out how to uh, pay labor and incentivize them to stick around and stay uh, and convince them that they're not just going to be let go in 2023 or 24 if the, if the oil markets turn again which in itself is a whole other macro issue not yeah, only exactly. just in the oil industry right the labor supply crunch that we're seeing um Let's continue to move on here. So someone asked, how do you see this scenario playing out for companies servicing big oil companies like those who make the rigs um, and also other services? Yeah, I've been I've tended to be a little bit pessimistic on oil field services, and I, but I think it depends. Um, if you think about uh, heavy equipment, so if you think about like pressure pumping and um, you know, the rigs themselves, this is all heavy equipment. There was a, a, a big glut of excess supply that has been out there for quite some time. Um, you know, if you look at rig counts in general, I mean, a lot of this is old equipment, but we used to have more than a thousand rigs running and we're nowhere near that level still. So there's still a lot of uh, flex capacity out there in, in a lot of cases, uh, a lot of spare, you know, horsepower on, on the pressure pumping side. So I think you have to be careful if you're getting involved in heavy equipment like that. Um, I actually think if you're going to get involved in that space, it's probably better to stick with like the uh, the bigger players that have kind of transfer like they've transitioned away from heavy equipment more towards uh, capital light kind of you know oil field services uh, stuff. So if you look at thinking about like Halliburton or or Schumerger or or these kind of names, I think that's where you're uh, you're better off uh, putting your dollars rather than in a uh, kind of like a niche uh, you know rig provider or something like that. Right. All right. Next question for you. Is the trend focusing on renewables and away from fossil fuels, or do they see an increase in drilling in eco-protected areas and other methods of increasing fossil fuel inventory? I mean, I think you definitely have a trend towards renewables regardless, right? Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, my approach to energy, right, is uh, um, I, I, I try not to have a, uh, a, a bias one way or another if I felt there was money in a uh, you know, offshore wind or solar, I would be investing there too. Um, I think, I just think the value isn't necessarily there. There has been a lot of advancements um, in uh, solar tech and in wind tech. The, you know, I think the question has always been um, how you supply the need for all of this solar and wind infrastructure um, and also on the battery storage side or, or any, other, any other kind of uh, storage solution for, uh, for, for electricity and power generation and storage. Um, you know, there's been a lot of issues and a lot of growing pains in that, in that part of the market. Um, you know, I think there are some parts of the, the renewable market that are interesting. I think the, you know, the biodiesel market and renewable diesel is super interesting. Um, you saw Chevron come out and buy Renewable Energy Group recently at a basically near 100% premium to, to the share price at the time. Granted the, you know, Reggie's uh, REGY, the share price had collapsed. Um, but you see a big trend, you know, from the refiners shifting to renewable diesel. You've, if you've followed the Biden administration's policies, you see some discussion about like sustainable aviation fuel and all these kind of things. And, you know, it's a really interesting market and it's at the end of the day, it's a government supported market, but you have to kind of move where the, where the puck is going and kind of follow, you know, where, where profits are going to be. And there's a, there's a, a rosy outlook for that sector in general, I think. So, yeah. All right, so moving on, Manny asks, big oil slash big energy is a very powerful player into what happens in the world. So how do you see it influence, how do you see it with the influence in the Ukraine conflict? I see that it has great benefits from this situation. Yeah, I mean, in general, if you think about the, you know, the Russia-Ukraine situation, I think the question for, uh, for the energy sector is, you know, if it's, it's very easy for Europe and the United States to sanction Russian barrels because you know crude is a is a global market. We have like seaboard and crude and, and tankers everywhere, right? So if you say I'm not going to buy Russian crude, then you just have to find an alternative source. And, that, and in a lot of cases, it's not necessarily hard to do. Sometimes you might have to step down the geopolitical ladder into some places you don't necessarily want to, like you know as we're dealing with like Venezuela or or Iran potentially for for heavy barrels. Um, but you know I think. There, there's always opportunity for uh, for big for you know super majors to kind of step in and and, and ramp production or uh, kind of uh, help support uh, you know shortfalls of in in the energy sector in general. 
Um, I think, you know, what happens with Russia and sanctions is going to have some cascading impacts. You know, it's a little bit quirky. Sometimes sanction barrels, you know, even if it's illegal, they always have a tendency to find their way into the market somehow, uh, at least a small portion of it. Um, but, you know, the Russian situation is very, uh, very unique. Um, I don't, I think what a lot of people don't know about Russia is they don't really have a lot of storage capacity. So a lot of their uh, production is very far uh, inland. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if once they're cut off from the market, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily consider this, but if you, if you don't have a place to ship your barrels and you don't have any place to store them, then you have to shut in your wells. And that, that takes that production offline. And especially with Russia being cut off from Western technology via sanctions, uh, it can be a very difficult to kind of bring that production back online if the Russian situation resolves itself, even if that's, you know, as soon as, you know, end of this year uh, and sanctions are taken back off. So, you know, we'll have to see there, but there's, it's going to be a very interesting geopolitical climate for oil, no matter what. Yeah, as you were just speaking, I couldn't help but think about, you know, Germany and Europe relying so heavily on Russia for this liquid natural gas and this oil supply. And as I was thinking about that, I was also remembering back, there was a news item that said Europe was going to get enough storage in their inventory for this next winter. And funny enough, Gene would like to know, could you comment on the summer storage loading volumes for this coming summer as this winter's heating load dissipates? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the situation for Europe, they were, they were lucky. The, the winter was fairly mild in general, but they're coming into this season with very low inventories. Um, what you've seen happen with the U.S. LNG market and, and global LNG trends in general is if cargoes weren't spoken for, so like if I'm a shipper and I, I'm not an Asian-based shipper, for instance, uh, if I have capacity to ship where I please, then you know, Europe has been willing to pay more than Asia. Uh, so you've seen Europe take more and more share. They're trying to build their inventories into this year. Um, I think the question is whether there's going to be enough um, as we kind of get into that period. So I think that's why you saw that Biden administration agreement and kind of come out and talk about how we're going to support uh, Europe. Um, you know, I think the, the tough question there is, you know, I think the administration is sort of claiming a little bit of benefit. You know, we have uh, saving pass. They have a new uh, uh, liquefaction train that came online uh, recently. And then you have Kakesu Pass as well that just came online. Um, US LNG, if you wanted to, even if you had unlimited money and you wanted to throw up a facility, um, it would take you, you know, three, four, five years to get it done. Um, so the question for Europe is, you know, if they want to move away from, from Russian sourced gas, um, it's going to take a while to, uh, to make that transfer. You, you know, I think you've seen some announcements. You saw uh, Tellurian, which is ticker T-E-L-L, -L, um, reach final invest in investment decision on Driftwood. So that's going to be proceeding. And then you saw, you know, it's a big favor of Seeking Alpha Rita's energy transfer. They had a uh, contract agreement on Lake Charles uh, that was uh, announced today. Um, even, if you, like, even if you think about Lake Charles, which is an advantage project, um, if they got all the contracts that needed tomorrow, it's still two and a half, three years to completion. So it's a 2025, 2026, 2027 uh, solution for Europe's problems. And I think the question is, what are they going to do in you know, 2022, 2023, and 2024? And I think that goes back to you know, the, you know, the VET pick of mine. It's so reliant on European gas prices. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think Europe's gas prices for natural gas are going to go down anytime soon. Yeah, it's kind of weird and, and strikingly eerie to me a little bit how what you're describing, I see a parallel in the semiconductor industry, right, with their foundries and everything shifting there and how it's also happening here. Exactly. Um, I couldn't help but see Sean's question, which I actually personally love, and I'm glad we found this one. It says, with countries like Saudi Arabia and others thinking about moving from the dollar for purchasing barrels of oil, how would that affect us? I mean, it's a... It's a... <laughs> It's an interesting question, right? The, the petrodollar, it's been, a, it's been a big discussion for, for quite some time and where you think about, uh, you know, U.S. dollar strength, especially as we get into to Fed rate policy decisions, you know, coming up this year and next. And, you know, that kind of gets back into this whole uh, inflation is transitory or is inflation a uh, something that's going to stick around for quite some time. You know, I think one of the my favorite things uh, to, to share with subscribers, if you go back to, you know, the 1970 period, uh, when inflation was rampant and you look at S&P performance, it was actually negative over, over that decade and it was about down 10 or 15%. But the energy sector returned 90% over that period. And I think one of the only other um, 
market segments that did well was was the REIT industry, oddly enough, so commercial real estate. Um, so I, I think the question there is if if the dollar kind of you know if we if we lose that status if they transition away from it if the dollar becomes weaker in general and we kind of see inflation stick around and it's something that the Fed can't control to the levels that they want then maybe you know uh, that makes energy especially a, a great place to be in that kind of scenario. Yeah, it's kind of hard to fathom with how strong the U.S. dollar is becoming. I mean, the journal just ran a, a report this morning about how the yen is staying weaker against the dollar and we're just getting stronger. Um, mm-hmm. I want to move on here, though. Jordan asked, do you foresee any benefit for hydrogen companies in the future with high oil prices? I think hydrogen is one of those quirky things. Um, it's definitely something that gets talked about a lot, especially in, you know, in the midstream industry, you know, as you know, pipeline companies tend, you know, as they start to think about what happens with all our pipelines when, you know, as oil and gas demand inevitably maybe like falls or maybe demand kind of shifts from one place in the United States to another, what do we do with all this spare capacity? And, you know, hydrogen hydrogen always kind of comes up in those discussions. Um, I think in general, the industry's view on hydrogen is tends to be a little bit maybe a little too early stage to really have a, a really strong foundational view on it. It's still viewed as very, very speculative. Um, I think if you talk to uh, you know, the energy space and energy investors, they tend to view like carbon sequestration. So rather than moving hydrogen by pipeline, we'll move carbon dioxide and we'll, you know, we'll pump it into old shale wells and we'll, we'll sequester it that way. That's viewed as a, a more uh, viable technology. Um, so at least, you know, at least for me, I tend to avoid, you know, the hydrogen space. I've, I've kind of concentrated on at least industries where there's a little bit more uh, near term commercial viability. But, you know, you know, there's plenty of investors that tend to lean towards more speculative kind of like uh, stocks and, and might see some value there, you know, five, 10 years down the line. But I've been more focused on uh, near term value. Yeah, that makes sense. I, th- I hear the word hydrogen, and I think extremely combustible. Right. So there's a long way we still have to go. Uh, maybe that's something that could go into an ARC ETF. We'll see. Um, yeah. Tom asks, does backwardation give premium today demand to offset disruption tomorrow to supply? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's the end of the day, you know, you know, backwardation, you know, the, you know, what that means is that investors are, are willing to pay more for a barrel today versus, you know, uh, uh, barrels down the line. So I, I think the, the way to interpret current backwardation is, you know, honestly, it's been around for uh, quite a long period of time now over the 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22 period, you know, the past five years. Um, and I think that really goes back to persistently low global inventories of oil in general. Um, you know, oil and gas sector has invested, underinvested in, in, uh, in developing new reserves and kind of replacing barrels that kind of go offline. So if you if you think about global, you know, supply, you know, if you think about it in that 100 million uh, barrels per day, um, if, you know, everybody has stopped investing uh, new funds into the sector uh, for a year, you, you know, you'd see 10, 10% decline rate, you know, across the space. So in the next year, you know, we'd only be producing 90 million barrels a day and we kind of go down from there um, until we see um, the global industry a little bit more willing to invest in the space and bring on new projects, then um, I don't think you see that kind of dynamic going away. And unfortunately, I think maybe this changes with a recent geopolitical environment, but you know, if you look at ExxonMobil, they saw a lot of pressure on some of their longer term projects that were slated to maybe come online 2028, 2030, because so many investors were afraid that you know, by the time these multi-billion dollar projects come online, oil and gas is gonna be, uh, demand is just going to be shrinking and you, you spent all this money and uh, you're not going to get a return on your investment. So I think both companies and investors and governments have to come to some sort of uh, strong conclusion on how they view oil and gas uh, as a fuel and the timeline for uh, a transition, if you believe a transition will happen. So if you think about the kind of net zero by 2050 kind of, kind of goals, kind of like firm those up so uh, everyone in the industry can be comfortable about uh, when and how um, demand is going to fall off. And, and, they're, and they'll make investing decisions around that that are in, uh, uh, that makes sense. But, uh, but until we get a little bit more policy clarity, I think you're going to see uh, the industry tend towards conservatism. 
Yeah. Just want to take a quick moment. Jody, I saw your comment. Um, I was just going to ask if the Seeking Alpha team could drop the link to the trial again in the chat box for those who joined late. And then we're going to continue on. Michael, just a few more questions for you before sure. we wrap up here. Um, with respect to the inventory list, wouldn't the increase in price alter the ramp up of the reserves? Uh yeah, as you kind of like think about things. So if you're if you're thinking about the question, kind of you know, will higher prices kind of you know lead to more development in general? Um, you know, to an extent, I think that's I think that's true. Um, I think the question there is, you know, it goes back once again to kind of like policy decisions and kind of like clarity on future prices. Because you know, I think the, I think what uh, how the media kind of portrays this in a way is like you know, especially. Maybe not as much now, but if you think about oil at like 110, 120 dollars a barrel, um, I think the media kind of views that as, oh, that's the price into perpetuity, and that that's what the oil and gas producer is going to realize. But you know, with backwardation so steep, and with price declines the way they are, I think uh, many oil and gas producers are a little bit more cautious on using those kind of valuations to make uh, drilling decisions. They tend to use more of what they view as like a, a mid-cycle price. So that might be. $55 a barrel, it might be $65 a barrel, you know, it could be higher, it could be lower, but um, there is a, there's a lot of caution from the industry and in kind of like extrapolating these prices forward, especially because they view it as maybe a somewhat, uh, not necessarily a demand driven price, but a supply driven price. So if we go back to like all the production being offline, and then at the same time, you know, potential supply ramping up, and, you know, they want to be careful that they don't uh, make a uh, long-term drilling decision on, based on short-term price moves. Yeah, you don't want a long-term glut. Um, let's get to this next one. Stephen asks, in light of your forecast for increased supply going forward, the economy does have a lot of positive momentum, which we've been hearing a lot over and over again. <laughs> so going out one year, are your stock price targets higher or lower for the big majors from current levels such as Exxon and Chevron? we got a lot of questions like this for you. Yeah. Uh, I, in general, I see, you know, my one year, I cover the majors uh, pretty in depth. Uh, you know, the thing with majors is, you know, they're not necessarily just upstream producers, right? So if you think about Exxon, you know, they, you know, they have production all over the world, of course, but they have a big chemicals division. They own, I think, like 35 or 40 refineries globally, and they have some pipeline presence as well. So there's, there's give and take in, in all of these companies and, and their price targets. So they're not necessarily dollar for dollar reliant on, on where oil goes or where gas goes. I think especially for Exxon, the chemicals business has performed wonderfully, especially in periods of low prices. It's a, it's a great balancing point for them. Um, but for my part, my price targets for, for the majors in general, uh, they tend to be uh, range from maybe 15 to 25 percent upside uh, from current prices. I tend to be a little bit more uh, bearish on the, you know, the European majors, if you think about like BP or, or someone like that. Um, just with some questions around like return on invested capital and their larger renewable programs and stuff like that. We'll have to see how that all plays out over time. Um, but um, I think in general with the majors, especially think about like Shell, it's a, you know, it's a great place to be. I think that's my, my favorite major. If you're going to put, put it someplace, you know, I think that plays well, especially if you think about the, you know, they have a bias towards natural gas, LNG, and, you know, the, I think these are all trends that they benefit from uh, over the long term versus some of the other other majors. So if you're going to put a dollar in place, I would probably put it in shell on the major side. Gotcha. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack just a second because you were talking sure. about the 2050 year net zero initiative, right? So Terry asks, what are your thoughts on produced scalable biochar carbon credits being purchased by big oil and other large corporations such as Microsoft, Delta, Berkshire Hathaway, oil and gas drillers, and headed to the farm fields for no-till regenerative farming? I think, you know, I think it's a, it's a viable solution. Um, you know, there's give and takes when you think about credit programs. Um, you know, you can look towards the uh, renewable volume obligation uh, or RBO scheme uh, in the United States for, for, for refineries as a great example. Um, you know, that whole system has kind of created some kind of Perverse incentives, especially you think about food prices right now, right? If you think about ethanol production, how much corn ends up destined for uh, uh, use in your gas tank versus on, on the table, I think that's a, a lot of pressure, uh, you know, on uh, on consumers kind of paying for things that way. Um, and I think that's actually, if if I was the Biden administration, that's an area I would kind of focus on. Maybe thinking about cutting RBOs, so you can kind of uh, 
lower food prices and gas prices at the same time because you know producing a gallon of ethanol is more expensive than a, than a gallon of gasoline. Um, so I think you have to be careful when you kind of design these programs, especially. Uh, you, you kind of uh, you can create incentives that you don't necessarily want. They need to be crafted well, and there needs to be uh, very strong political oversight. Um, you know, at the end of the day, that maybe that's a tough thing to ask, especially for uh, for the government. And it's you know it's you know it has its hands in so many things that sometimes policy decisions can be late. Um, but I think it's a I think it's a it's a good solution to to look at to kind of you know, incentivize lower production. And I think the oil and gas industry is super interested in it. If you look at the, you know, we've talked about natural gas stocks today, you know, responsibly sourced gas is a, is a big thing that they're trying to, to push and kind of take off. So, you know, with that, you have inspections on oil wells, making sure there's no like fugitive methane emissions and carbon emissions. And, you know, I think at least for now, it seems that, you know, major players are willing to pay a a small premium, but a premium to non-responsibly sourced gas. So there's a there's a uh, there's a market for it, and uh, you know if, if people are willing to pay for it and to uh, to be able to slap a sticker on there that they're more environmentally friendly, then I I'm all for it, and I think the industry is all for it. Yeah. All right, Michael, I'm gonna do one more with you before we get out of here because we're getting close to sure. the top of the hour. We want to respect our audience's time. Um, so real quickly, just in a few words, what are your thoughts about coal? Uh, I think coal is interesting. I think that my worry with coal, um, obviously, if you're in coal producers right now, coal prices are very high. These guys are making uh, a lot of money, uh, same as oil and gas, right? I think the, the question with coal is, um, I think the worry always with it is if it's going to be kind of like the sacrificial lamb in a way, right? So if you're, uh, if you're uh, f- you know, positive on fossil fuels uh, in general, maybe you say, oh, okay, we'll, we'll give you coal and we'll do coal power plant retirements, but um, we need some concessions and, and in that way, maybe we uh, move towards natural gas and natural gas fire generation before we jump straight to like solar and wind, right? Because I think the question with coal, you know, it's a, it's a big part of, it's still a big part of our energy generation here uh, in the United States and globally, if you think about China and exports and everything like that as well. Um, but I think, you know, as we think about like, you know, once again, like net zero by 2050, those kind of targets, you know, coal is, you know, it sits very high on that chain. It's like, it's the easiest thing to get chopped. Um, and I think that probably happens. Uh, but the question I think is, you know, if you're investing in coal, maybe you, uh, if prices are high, you get enough out of your investment, you know, it's a typical cigar butt investment, right? Maybe you make all your money back in a couple of years and it doesn't really matter if the industry is dead by 2030. So you just have to be very price conscious and, uh, and confident in your uh, pricing predictions for, for the commodity. Yeah. All right, everyone. There you have it. The man, the myth, the legend, Michael Boyd. Also, David Chu says, you look like Michael Prince, right? We all <laughs> just take a second. Love the Billions reference. Yes. Um, Michael, can't thank you enough for the time you join, uh, for joining us today and giving us the time. Again, everyone, this is Michael Boyd from Energy Investing Authority. He is running a two- free week trial right now. So go over, check out all of the research he's been putting out to his audience. And we thank you. And we can't wait to see you to the next webinar. Take care. Yeah, I'll be happy to do this again anytime. Well, we will. Take care. All right. Have a good one.